Hey folks, this is Michael Curtis, and today we're going to be covering the infamous power alley and how to prevent it. It's the low end that piles up and pummels you down the middle and makes everything else uneven throughout your audience. It's something we can't control, but we have to learn the one thing that causes it to happen. Today, I'm going to be using the Audio Math Survival Spreadsheet. It's a tool that I have in my audio toolkit, which you can get at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit, or just click the link below. It's also got my 9 EQ pivot points guide. It'll have the map 3D file for the system design from this video, so you can download it and uh, mess around things yourself. So let's jump into the low end menace, the power alley. So what are power alleys anyway, and what are the underlying principles that cause them to happen? So I'm gonna pull up map 3D here, and I've got a medium sized venue, a 16 by 20 stage. We get a single 18 inch sub down here in the middle. And I'm gonna look at 63 Hertz and hit predict. What I want to illustrate here is that the coverage of sources that primi primarily produce low end is going to approach omnidirectional. So they're going to move in all directions. So a high frequency being very small is easy to use physical means to control it. So we have a, a horn, a compression driver with wave guides that make it go in a specific direction. So 2K and up is really easy to steer. The lower you go in frequency, forget about it. So especially 63 Hertz does not care. And it's just gonna go like an orb just radiating from the subwoofer. Um, so I just wanna make that clear from the get-go. So if we have two of these subs placed 40 feet apart from each other, we have these two sources that are both radiating from each other. We're gonna have a bunch of overlap. And this overlap is gonna create a series of summation and cancellation, most known as the power alleys, and then as lesser known cousin, the power valley. And so this is gonna alternate through our audience in this repeatable pattern. So what's happening here is 63 Hertz, we can do a little anatomy of that frequency. If I put that in here, it's gonna take 15.87 milliseconds for it to do a complete period. So that's starting from atmospheric pressure, resting up to positive, back through the negative, and back to resting. It's gonna take that amount of time. And it's going to travel almost 18 feet to get there. So looking again, specifically at this frequency, if they are coming from this house right sub to the center, in this house left sub to the center, we're gonna expect summation here because they are coming together and arriving right at the middle. So they're taking the same amount of time to get there. But we can actually calculate um, with this amazing graphic from Merlin Van Veen, um, what's gonna happen to two frequencies when they're arriving at any offset in, in time. So if they're arriving at the same time, that's the same as a zero degrees phase relationship. And we're going to get plus six dB in, uh, that's the maximum we could ever get between two sources of you know, plus, plus six dB of summation. But it's evil twin. If something is arriving 180 degrees offset, we're gonna get complete and total or almost total cancellation. But then we have all this space in between of some of it is going to, you're gonna get either some addition or some subtraction. So I want you to imagine this phase wheel on the right now, we have two thirds of the phase wheel, we're either gonna get the same or zero dB or up to plus six dB, or we're gonna get cancellation. So if we can think about this phase wheel starting from the center here of zero degrees of completely correlated and more or less rolling throughout our audience. So if we're starting here, we're gonna get our plus six, it's gradually moving throughout phase and it's basically zero dB now. And now this, I was two thirds of it. And now this one third of the phase wheel is either, okay, I'm loose, losing some, now it's completely canceled. And now I'm moving back again, the other side of the phase wheel or moving through gradual addition up to plus six down to zero. And so we see this cyclical path found in the phase wheel. So you can just imagine with two separate sources at a given frequency, imagine that size of phase wheel rolling throughout your audience. But this is happening at all frequencies at once. So if I move up to 100, um, it's just going to be a smaller phase wheel because 100 hertz um, is a 10 millisecond uh, period time and it's 11 feet. So now we have an 11 foot total circumference phase wheel rolling throughout our audience 
so taking less space to do its thing, all right? Uh, and this isn't a phenomenon that's unique to subwoofers since we have mains that are able to do that as well. I'm gonna hit predict at 100. I've got two six box line arrays at, at that 40 foot spacing uh, and they too do the same thing, even if they're flown. Uh, so uh, granted, you get a little bit more steering if you have a big long array in the low frequencies, but it's still a phenomenon. So boiling it all down, we can say that two frequencies uh, from the same correlated source, like a bass guitar put in two places, arriving at a point in space, not at the same time, or they're arriving at the same time, but a delta in their phase relationship to each other, you're gonna get, you're gonna roll the dice and figure out if they're gonna get addition, stay the same, or subtraction. So what happens then if we take a our two sub array and put both of them right together in the middle? And so this is ba basically these two subs butted up right up against each other. We're gonna get a beautiful sphere moving very evenly throughout our audience. We're still gonna have a lot coming back on the stage, which we can solve later, but because we do not have this distance offset, um, we're not having this phase wheel roll around our audience, we're having it uh, come from almost the same point in space, and we're gonna have a nice, even setup. But what if we're in a narrow venue, not this wide one, we don't want this thing moving throughout our audience. And so if I have our two center subs again, and look at 63 hertz. Um, there's a lot coming on stage and a lot moving out in the walls. It's just gonna bounce around. So this is a 50 by 100 venue. So we can actually use this displacement to our advantage because what happens if you place two subs apart uh, is actually you're going to get a narrowing in coverage. It feels counterintuitive, but being able to, uh, two subs together gets you really broad even coverage but two subs apart is going to narrow it okay so how did i figure out how to put these two subs at this spacing let's see what it looks like at 63 we're going to see instead of moving in this this circle here it kind of moved to an oval and it's fitting itself to that room we're using the rest of our arrays that are flown to really point out the audience why can't we do the same thing with our low end let's see look at 100 hertz now so uh, it's really tight here, okay? <laughs> and so so is this too tight? Uh, so back, how did I figure out this particular spacing? Um, we can look at our subarray and uh, you know, once we decided our crossover frequency or our frequency divider where it's handing off custody of the upper frequencies to the mains, uh, I decided that was going to be a hundred hertz for this array. And we can look at 100 and two thirds wavelength is 7.53 feet. Because here at our phase wheel, I have two thirds of it where I'm gonna get some sort of addition. So if they're right next to each other or come from the same spot, it's basically no offset. So I'm gonna get a full 6 dB, but I have a full two, whole two thirds swing for it to be able to combine, like, hey, get some sort of summation. So that is the maximum width. So I would look at my crossover frequency or basically the top of where you want your sub responsible, and that's how far you could place them. And you can verify that it's working or not by uh, putting some microphones out in the audience. So I have one here at center depth right here, and then one here off to the side. So this is basically center and then off axis. And I can look at my measurements here uh, and there's a 6 dB spread and that's the maximum I want to allow. Um, and that's usually, you know, a speaker's gonna be zero on axis then 6 dB at its coverage edges. And so this is a good looking array for this particular room. I went to the middle of the audience um, and, and put one in the center and one uh, off to the side. And if it's within 6 dB, I'm great with that. So as opposed to having, let's look at these two center subs again and compare that coverage. So these two center guys, it's gonna be nice and loud, uh, but it's gonna have a lot radiating out and bouncing off the, the walls near us. But if I have it spaced apart uh, right here on my 240 degree spacing, it's going to make that nice and tight. Um, and then from here down, it's gonna make that pattern 
even better or more per perfectly suited for this particular room. But if I wanted to get even fancier, I could do a gradient array. So I did this array, uh, this exact one on an outdoor show where the audience was really wide and it worked well. I'll have you look at the coverage at 63. So we're getting a lot of summation and a nice more broad oval shaped, um, I guess horizontally, ovally shaped, ovalish shaped <laughs> pattern that their audience and we're getting a lot of rejection on stage. This is an inline gradient array. And what I did is found the center frequency that I wanted, uh, which was 63 Hertz. I uh, moved the rear sub a quarter wavelength of that. So that was four and a half feet uh, behind that sub. I delayed it by another quarter wavelength, which was four milliseconds in inverted polarity. That's the recipe for inline gradient is a uh, backwards movement of a quarter wavelength, an additional delay in that sub of a quarter wavelength, and then invert polarity. Um, you just have to be cognizant of your crossover frequency so you can't do too big of a spacing. Uh, Bob McCarthy read, recommends about a meter. Uh, I went a little bit longer so I can get maximum summation. So anyway, so this is a great ar array for this. But again, in our narrow venue, I can get all the rejection in the world off the stage, but I'm gonna have so much since it's ballooning out wide that doesn't work. But what if I did our same 240 degree spacing, but also did it gradient? So I did the same uh, rear sub placement of quarter wavelength placement, quarter wavelength delay, but then also put them seven and a half feet apart. Let's look at this at 63 Hertz. And beautiful. So I don't have much on the stage. It's also fitting nicely to the venue. And then let's look now at 100 Hertz. So right at my crossover, again, this is a beautiful pattern. I guess the folks standing right here aren't getting the most <laughs> ideal. Still not that huge of a difference um, looking throughout the rest of the venue. So again, it's a funny looking array, but it looks really nicely. Um, so let's lay in this plane. So power alleys happen when you have two sources uh, with the same thing coming through them and they arrive at a point in space. At the same time, you get summation. And if they arrive at different points in their phase cycle, uh, they're either going to, again, sum, stay the same, or cancel. So you're going to get this rotating phase wheel rolling throughout your audience where two-thirds of it is going to be summing, and then a third is going to be a big cancellation. And then two-thirds summing and a big cancellation, right? Um, so that happens when we have displacement or a delta between two of the same thing coming out of two different speakers. So if we put sources close together, we get maximum summation. But we can use this phenomena of this pattern of, of ripple sort of audience to actually shape where we want the low end to go. So I can place two subs up to two thirds wavelength of the crossover frequency apart and actually narrow our coverage. So if I got a big long room, that's a great idea. If I have a really wide audience. I'm going to do subs close together so I can get it to radio out wide. And so knowing how the power alley forms by this displacement in time is key to being able to sh shape your low end correctly. So I definitely prioritize your mains coverage uh, because if there's no intelligibility, because the high end isn't right, then you're not going to get hired <laughs> for your next show. But if you've got the time, definitely make sure you have your low end pointed in the right direction. It's hard because low end really can't be guided easily by physical means. So you have to do some, some tricks in displacement and delays and such to get it to do what you want it to do. So the audio math survival spreadsheet I was using is available at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit, or I got the link below. It's got a bunch of other great stuff in it. Make sure to grab it. My name is Michael Curtis and I appreciate you watching. See you in the next one.